Okay. Let's call this regular meeting of the Darien Board of Finance to order for Tuesday, November 19th, 2019. Thanks to everyone for coming. Uh, we've got uh, two new members to welcome today. Uh, Dan Baumgartner to my left here, and then Taylor Carter over to my right. Thank you, friends, for being here. Congratulations on uh, getting elected. Uh, <clears throat> So the first order of business is election of officers for the board. We have three positions, uh, chair, vice chair, and secretary or clerk to the board. And I've talked with several of you about that today. Uh, I'll start by opening up for nominations for chairman. Well, if I can nominate. You can. Um, big surprise, I'm gonna nominate John. Um, you know, just for the benefit of the TV audience, he's really obviously a very smart, knowledgeable guy, gift for running a pretty good meetings and keeping us all engaged and on the same page. Uh, John is just being board chair of the Board of Finance is just one of the many ways Darien residents are lucky to live here. So. Well, I'm John Zagrodsky and I approve that message. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you, uh, Frank. Um, are there any other nominations for this position? Okay. Motion to approve. Rob Cardone, second. Jim Palin. All in favor? And I will abstain. Six to zero to one. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the vote of confidence. Um, I've been doing this for a while now and happy to uh, continue in this role. It's an important board and it's a privilege to be part of it. So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, I'd like to do nominations actually for vice chair. Jim. I'd like to nominate Mr. Frank Huck for okay. vice chair. I'm not sure if I can be as eloquent, but <laughs> Frank has done a great job, not only when John is not here, but um, when John is here. And <laughs> he has an incredible wealth of information and fun to hang out with. And uh, I think I've been a great asset for this board and uh, love to see him continue. I concur with every one of those sentiments. Um, motion to approve the nomination of Mr. Huck. As oh, are there any oh, oh, I'm sorry. Are there any other nominations for the position of vice chair? All right, uh, motion to approve the nomination of Mr. Huck as Vice Chair of the Board of Finance. Mr. Hendrickson, Paul, second. Rob, all in favor? It is unanimous. Okay. And then finally, I'd like to uh, have a nomination for the position of a Secretary to the Board. That's you. Uh, uh, I'll do it. Uh, uh, our new member, one of our new members, Dan Baumgartner. Um, uh, very conscientious guy. He'll do a fabulous job of uh, keeping the minutes straightforward and honest. And uh, so I'd like to nominate Dan. Well, I appreciate that. That's great. Um, uh, it's great to have you step into a role like this uh, on your first go around. I had this happy job for three years myself, and actually it was great. There was no better platform to learn about things than being, being uh, secretary to the board. So any other nominations for the position of secretary? Hearing none, uh, could I have a motion to approve the nomination of Dan as our secretary for the coming year? Okay, Rob, second. Jim, all in favor? Terrific, okay, thank you very much. Excellent, so we have our officers for the coming um, year for the Dairy Board of Finance. Next up is transfers, Jennifer. First one that we have, we actually have Fire Marshal here to discuss his request for some funds for digitizing documents. Good evening, Mr. Bush, nice to see you, sir. Thank Good you for coming. You uh, my request is for $8,500 to digitize our existing um, fuel oil and gasoline tank records that we have in our office. Um, we've got 30 plus years worth of records. We'd like to digitize them to make them available so that the public, when they come into in our office, whether it's the attorneys, title searchers, general public, realtors, um, we're going to set up a workstation so that they can access the records, look up what they need to to save some staff time, and uh, be able to print and pay for their what they printed. And then eventually, it would be the goal would be to make it available so off our website. Terrific. Um, <coughs> this was going to be a capital request, but learning that there was funds left over from a current digitizing project, right. um, I'd like to tap off of that. So I'm certainly supportive of this. It's the 21st century to get these kinds of records digitized. Uh, my only comment is that it's felt like for a long time there's always something to digitize, um, and maybe that'll go on for some time. I don't know if there's a 
general sense of a plan that says for all the records under the town's purview, <clears throat> we're going to knock them off in this order and it's going to take this length of time and maybe it takes several years to kind of go through it, but it feels like we get a request like this. Not that this is a terrible surprise. I mean, it's fine. But if we get a request like this and it doesn't feel like a master, part of a master plan uh, as opposed to something that's kind of ad hoc. What do you think about that? Currently there is no master plan. Ah, it's been okay. as departments identify records that they think would benefit both the department and the public by having them digitized and available okay. either at the kiosks or online. Um, I can certainly talk to Kate and see how she feels about coming up with a grand plan for digitizing okay. historical documents and then staying current. Okay. Well, it seems it seems like a set of documents that actually get visited by. They do. <laughs> <laughs> well, they so, need to know this. Yeah. yeah but when yeah, you need so it, that, you need it. To me, that it strikes me as a absolutely pretty good choice. Yep. Sure. So, will there be a kiosk that people access it from at the firehouse? There will be out, outside my office in town hall, fire marshal's office. Okay. All right. And then the ultimate goal is working with IT to get it so that people can actually just go onto our website and access it from wherever. And in terms of the, the, like the system that we're going to use to ultimately access it, you know, it, it may be helpful if we're able to somehow integrate that with any other software that we use just so that we then minimize like software maintenance yep. and, and other things just so they're not do. Well, along those lines, um, <laughs> there's a significant balance left over from that planning and zoning and building department, the 109,000 of which 8,500. Um, if you approve it, it'll move to the fire marshal. Kate and I have talked about, and she's preparing an RFP for a technology assessment for all the town departments, the systems we currently use, um, how can we integrate things better, reduce points of sale so that maybe somebody can buy their dump permit and pay their taxes and do everything else, maybe a one-stop shop. So we will be coming to you once we have some numbers from that RFP to do this technology assessment out of these funds, and that would be kind of part of it, is how can we start to marry up all these various systems. Is it feasible to actually originate with a digital record rather than a paper record that then would have to be scanned, or is that biting too much off? Is that part of a technology study that could be done so that if you're applying for something, you're doing it electronically and there's no paper? And I will talk to Kate about seeing if we can work that into the assessment, look for opportunities for that. That's a great point. I mean, we all do all that at work. I mean, I can't remember the last time I filled out a form or completed something by hand on a piece of paper that had to be scanned, so that's a good point. Uh, Rob? Um, on the unspent violence, how do we get to 109? Is that, did we overshoot the budget or is it, were we really efficient? Did we choose a software package that was better? Because it just seems like a rather large number that's kind of unspent. Right. Um, it is a very large number. They spent, I think, about half of what their total appropriation mm -hmm. was. It was twofold. The initial estimates were not very good. The company came in, looked at one file cabinet or one drawer and said, okay, if you have however many of those, that times the the number is what we would estimate. So that was the initial budget estimate. And then as they were actually doing the scanning, um, the departments realized that there probably wasn't a need because there's not that much demand for certain types of documents. So they didn't scan all the types of documents that they initially thought they were going to. So we still s left with unscanned documents in a paper form? Right, because they just are not either there's not a high demand for accessing them, mm -hmm. um, or th I forget what types of documents they are, but they weren't really relevant to maintaining a, a current record. Okay. How'd you get to the 8,500 number here? The vendor that um, Planning and Zoning and Building Department used, I contacted him, mm -hmm. I estimated about how many file boxes of records that I had, and based on total number of well type records, he prepared his estimate off of that. Okay. And have, have we learned anything in this process that mistakes <coughs> could be avoided or uh, no <laughs> no not that I not okay. that I've heard from planning and zoning I think it, it went well for them I think they they learned that the public it, it's very useful to have them digitized will, yeah. will these be cross-referenced with the with the other it is yeah. ultimately 
plan okay. is to so that people can look it up anywhere. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. Any other questions for Bob? Okay. Uh, motion to approve. Bob, second. Paul, all, all in favor? Great. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Okay. Next up, uh, this is our annual salary transfer, Jennifer. Yes. Um, so this is to transfer the salaries during the budget. We did not have final salary increases for um, the police union and town hall unions. They settled during the budget process. And then, as always, we did the non-union um, wage increase with the Board of Selectmen um, for July 1st. So this is just to move money out of the salary contingency account and into the various department lines. Um, so that. Uh, salary contingent account has four hundred and one thousand dollars, I think, in it. Uh, yes, is, I believe or so. something like that. So this is two hundred sixty-five thousand dollars. Is this is is this all the transfers, or do we just have an excess of budget in that account? Um, we have an excess of budget in there. Part of that is the um, contracts when they did settle settled lower than we had anticipated in the budget. Okay. So, that, so in other words, there are not more anticipated transfers for that account for the rest of the year. Right. There, if there were to be any reclassifications of positions or something like that, but no large scale transfer. Like this. Okay. All right. That's fine. Uh, other questions for Jennifer on this, Rob? Jen, what's going on at Police Patrol? The one twenty is that just a body or is that? Um, their contract was by now. It's actually two years out. This is two years of increases. Um, okay. Because their contract was more than a year out when we settled last year, so this is the second year of increase. And that's not an unusual number. It's usually somewhere in there. Right. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Motion to approve. So move. Dan, second. Frank. All in favor? Okay, next is the cemetery cleanup with a long story. <laughs> yes. Um, so the cemetery committee, you had approved in the fiscal 19 budget. Um, some capital funds that they fully used. They wanted to do some more work. The Monuments and Ceremonies Commission, um, of which the cemetery group is a subcommittee, um, Monuments and Ceremonies authorized using $4,000 of the Monuments and Ceremonies operating funds for cemetery cleanup. Um, in addition, through F&B's review of funds, we identified the Sarah Wilson Trust Fund that had about $9,000 in it. Um, miscommunication with when an invoice was submitted in May, the way it was coded, it was interpreted to charge it all to the Sarah Wilson Trust. Um, so at the end of the year, that $4,000 that monuments and ceremonies had authorized for them to use went unspent, but the cemetery committee didn't realize that it went unspent. They had, they thought that it had been spent. So fast forward, they submitted an invoice for $650 recently. This is when we discovered that there was a miscommunication on the coding. So Monuments and Ceremonies is now looking to replenish that $4,000 that lapsed so that they can do work this year. And also they had another, before the error was discovered or the miscommunication was discovered, they had incurred another $2,130. So they're asking for $6,130 out of the capital reserve into their cemetery cleanup fund to do work this year, pay the outstanding invoices, and, and do some additional work. Well, I think it's worth it just for the drama and, and intrigue <laughs> and the fact that it's a cemetery not that long after Halloween, but I mean, okay. Um, I mean, these types of mistakes are understandable. Any, any questions on this? What's this, I just, what's the Sarah Wilson Trust? <laughs> uh, like I said, intrigue. <laughs> you know, we have the man here <laughs> who <laughs> loves to talk about <laughs> sleepy funds. Yeah, it, it, it's there. <laughs> it is now depleted down to like forty dollars. All right, so let's see. Okay, <laughs> it's not relevant going forward. We're ready to hear the whole story. <laughs> We're ready to hear it. Okay. Uh, no other questions. Motion to approve. Jim, second. Paul, all. all in favor. Great. Thank you. Okay, that is it for transfers. Uh, Jim is going to give us a quick update on the teacher union contract. Jim. Okay. Well, as you all know, I, I served as the Board of Finance representative on the Board of Ed's recent negotiation with the Darien Education Association, uh, the, the, the upcoming three-year contract. Um, I put together a few pages here, which I, which I can run through. Um, 
and just wanted to go over some of the highlights here and kind of point out what some of the some of the changes were um, related to it. What I would tell you is, from a very high level, the it's a three-year contract that'll extend from uh, June, sorry, from July 1st, 2020, out through June 30th, 2023, and over those three years, it'll allow for a um, a 10.9 percent increase in salaries. Um, if you look at it from a simple perspective and an actual increase of 11.34 percent over those three years which That's just compounds for the right. exactly the the 10.9 the is simply the mathematical addition of the three different year increases which are 3.7 3.6 and 3.59 um, but when you actually compound it ends up being 11.34 percent and i think it's important to take a minute because we'll i'm sure we'll hear about that number is how that number is calculated and what it represents. You know, currently we have about 484 full-time equivalent teachers. And those teachers have different types of um, uh, educational degrees, bachelor's, master's, <coughs> master's plus 15, 30, 60 different types of credits. And they all have different levels of, of, uh, of experience. And the way that teachers are paid are based on the number of years, their, their educational degree and their, um, the number of years which they have been teaching. So the way that the Board of Ed and, and other Board of Eds throughout the, uh, throughout the state measure the, the increases, they assume that all 484 teachers stay employed by the district. All those teachers that are not at the top step continue to advance one step through the contract, and we'll get to that later and that all of those teachers are here for all three years. And so assuming that the teacher population does not change and all the teachers that can advance still advance through their educational uh, columns, that would equate to a, what you see here is a 3.71% increase uh, in the upcoming budget, 3.6 in the next, and 3.59 in the third year. Now, not all teachers will remain the entire time. Some can leave. Those teachers could be hired with teachers with less experience, with more experience, with different types of degrees, and, and a lot of things could happen to, to change that number. Um, but in terms of, you know, when we compare this to other, other settlements, that's how the number's actually calculated. You know, the salaries are about 85% or so of the total teacher compensation. The other 15% comes from the portion of their like the health care contracts that the, uh, that the Board of Ed pays for. Um, currently, Darien teachers pay about 21% of their, um, their health care premiums, which I would say is the highest if you look in the DRG, the DERG A, which, we, um, which Darien typically compares itself to and, and includes primarily you know, schools in the southwest of Connecticut. Um, well, another important part of the contract was that uh, Teachers in the middle school and high school can now be assigned up to five courses per year, whereas previously they were only um, the contract only required them to, to teach four and a half courses per year, and before that, they were only required to teach three years. Um, it's like courses, it's sections. Sorry, sections. It was Those are originally four. And then under the prior contract, it was moved to four and a half, and now under this contract, it'll move from four and a half to five. And there are a couple different, um, obviously, if teachers teach more, uh, more courses or more sections, sections thank you, um, over the long term, there'll be less teachers to teach the same number of students. But in the short term, there are also some immediate savings that the, that the board can realize because teachers, some teachers were actually teaching more than four and a half, and they would receive a, a, a premium for that. If you were teaching five rather than four and a half, that meant you were teaching an additional 11% workload, and teachers were compensated an extra 11%. So in the very near term, as in next year, again, if all the teachers remain constant, we'd see some immediate savings, which could be about $200,000 per year, and that would bring the, each of those percentages in the top line down by 20 to 30 basis points, again, depending on what happens with teachers. Um, and then I think the last part is what I'd point out is in this contract, each year, each teacher that's not at the top step would move up by one step per year, and that's, that was consistent with the, last, with the last contract. And then finally, although it's a much smaller piece of the budget, stipends related to leadership positions and 
extracurricular and coaching stipends will generally go up by 2%. That's per year or 2% per year or? 2% per year. Yeah. What, what has been our savings on teacher turnover average for the past few years? So it's a good point. I think if you if you went back and you looked at what was projected to be the increase over the last couple contracts, you would see because teachers turn over and a lot of that turnover are more senior teachers leaving and being replaced with teachers who have less years of experience, mm -hmm. you'd see that these numbers, like in this instance at the 3.7, the 3.6, and the 3.5, have not actually played out their actual um, you know the actual realized increases have been left. I don't have all the all the numbers on do, that. Do you know if the, either their business manager or HR director keeps track of that? They, they do keep track of that. That's a number we could certainly ask for as, as part of mm -hmm. you know, ultimately when they budget for this. Um, some of that turnover I know is budgeted and for. You mentioned keeping the FTE constant and increasing the number of sections they teach. With it, what impact is that going to have on class size? Or did they even go into that? They, they didn't go into class size. Again, this is just the same number of teachers. The only direct impact that you'd see right away is about $200,000 in savings, which are, again, from a, a teacher who's getting paid an extra 11% to teach five, mm -hmm. will no longer get paid. Yeah, but if, if I'm teaching four and now I'm being mandated to teach five, I would assume our class size would decrease by 20%. Or what could happen is over time through attrition, um, mm -hmm. they just want to replace. They could reduce. <coughs> they, they could move. They could reduce teachers mm -hmm. again in those schools okay. in theory by up to eleven percent. But again, this is there's a lot of scheduling and operational um, stuff yeah. that goes into this, and so the actual savings could be less or could be more. Okay. Right. So I don't. You know, again, this is just based on. Plus, they wouldn't phase all this in immediately. Correct. Yeah, so correct. So then um, there were a couple sort of non-financial aspects that were added to the contract um, that they dealt with. One dealt with sort of you know, teachers and, and tutoring students outside. One of them was updates on how they reimburse teachers for um, who, who seek reimbursement for additional uh, credits that they take towards their next degree. Um, and then some other just operational ones in terms of teachers requesting substitutes and so forth. There's also a, um, a memorandum of understanding that they had around sort of wrap time, which are um, I know which was very important to the to the superintendent, which talked about you know, teachers being there sort of before school and after school. But these are things that you know they'll work with the teachers over the next you know over the, the balance of this year to implement. Um, on the next page, you know, a couple things. And what was the accelerated step increases for lowest school? Yeah, so on that, some of the teachers that enter, depending on, you know, because the bachelor's, um, the bachelor's step starts off at three and others start off at four, basically the current cohort of teachers, which are in those lowest steps, and this is a relatively small amount of teachers, will basically get step increases. Okay. where they may not have others. It was a small change that they made, but it was one I think that they expected long-term would help to attract um, help to attract new teachers into those those bottom steps of the, of the different cohorts. Okay. Yeah, next page, just talking a little bit about the process and so forth. You know, the Board of Ed had put together a negotiations committee, included four members from the Board of Ed, um, included Dr. Adley, March, Sion, who is the HR director, and Richard Rudel, who's the new finance director. Um, I was the uh, the board of finance representative. Um, I was allowed to be present during all the negotiations. Um, and then the, the teachers had 10 members, um, and, and both sides had their legal counsel there. The, the district was represented by Tom Mooney, who's been doing this for an extremely long time. Yep, 43 years. Yes, almost as long as I've been alive. Um, the negotiation process, um, we met numerous times over what ended up being almost a three-month period. Um, the Board of Ed and the, uh, the teachers actually agreed on a, uh, on a contract uh, during mediation on the 12th, and the Board of Ed, um, or the teachers then ratified it, and the Board of Ed, as you may know, last Tuesday at their regular meeting, um, voted unanimously to approve the contract. So in terms of next steps as it relates to the contract, um, ultimately it will be presented to the, uh, the RTM for their review. 
the way that that works is it's submitted with the town clerk and then after that their RTM has 30 days to to take action on it or no action um, after which it um, it becomes effective on the next page I just put together an example of sort of how um, how the salary changes were implemented. On the left side of this page here, you can see that's the current grid. And the first grid you can see is for the teachers with the bachelor, second with masters, masters plus 15, and so forth. Um, the way that the next three years of salary grids were created were that all the teacher, all the steps going from three to 18 were all increased by one half of a percent in each of the next three years. And the bottom step, or I should say the top step, step 19, was increased by 1.5% in each of the next three years. So when and people call the TWI is basically kind of the blended of the half percent and the 1.5%. Correct. And so this little example right here, which um, was, in red, was in red ink here, you can see that, for example, a teacher that's master's 10, Going over one master's year 11. will step down to master's 11 and that's you know right frank that's what they refer to as a step increase so that would be in this case you know, like four and a half percent and then they go over to the next year's 11 and that's what we call the gwi or the um, the gross wage increase um, and gets them to the total increase did <clears throat> did the Percentage changes between steps increase or change as part of this negotiation? They didn't. The, the, the steps all remained the same. There were no additional steps put in and no steps skipped. Um, and other than the fact that larger numbers multiplied by a half percent will create a slightly larger step. I um, mean, I have another page on this that talks about okay. that, but the steps mm -hmm. were not increased. That's one of the things I think it's, it's important to understand about um, looking at the overall percent increase of this contract when you compare it to others. So if everybody's, everybody understands sort of how teachers will move through these different grids here. Right. <clears throat> so if you think about the 1.5% the for the top step and the 0.5% for the all other steps, if you think about those two numbers, how do those two numbers compare to maybe what other districts negotiated? So, so kind of a half percent per year, one and a half percent per year, does that compare favorably or disfavorably with what you saw negotiated in other districts? Uh, and I would say the 1.5, which is the increase to the top grid, seemed to be on par with what others um, have gotten. Like Greenwich, for example, just, just settled on 1.6, but they've all been in that sort of you know, plus or minus 1.5. And on the 0.5, it's, um, you know, it's, it's been that or, or lower in some, in some cases. Like okay. for example, Greenwich settled theirs, and it was 0% for the first steps, and it was 1.6 for the top step. Got it. Now, I think as we think about these percentages right here, I would point you to the bottom left right here where we look at the teacher population here. So there's about 28% of our teachers are at the top step. So you would say, so 28% of the teachers received 1.5, and the other 72% of the teachers came up their step, and then to the right to each, in each of the following years. And you can see it's a, outside of the top step, it's a fairly uniform distribution of give or take 5% of the teachers in all the other steps. Now, if I were a young teacher being recruited in Darien, I would look at where I was gonna come in and I'd also look at the top step and how long it took me to, to get, get there. there. So there's some, I'm guessing, but I don't know, that there's some recruitment benefit to not having the top step be too low. Co correct. They, they want to, I think they, you know, they, they want to see where they come in, how they advance, and where they can ultimately get to. So I would just also point out when you're thinking about what the teacher population looks like, the vast majority, you know, 53% have masters. Um, 25, 24% have masters plus 30 credits. You know, that's only 
So master's plus have provided additional credits right. beyond that. So the 94% have master's degree plus something. Correct. Right. And so when you're thinking about, I gave some examples of how we compared to other schools. I use the master's just because that, that, that includes 53% of our teachers. So on the next page here, what I tried to provide was a breakdown of what does the first year look like? Um, so if you look at the steps between 1 and 18, or I should say between 3 and 18, you can see that 90% um, of, the, of the increase that the teachers are getting come from steps in that cohort, and only 10% of it come from the GWI. Okay. <clears throat> And if you look at the top step, well, of course, th there is no step increase there. So the step increase is zero, but the GWI is 1.5. And so what I try to do on this table here is to give you an idea, well, what does the overall sort of salary increases look like throughout the teacher populations? And you can see there's a 350 teachers in the, in the steps, 3 through 18. They're about 72% by number. But when you look at obviously the lower steps command lower salaries usually they have, they have less years of experience that's about 64 percent of the total salary pool those 72 percent of the teachers are getting approximately 4.4 in their average step some are below that some are above that and half a percent in the gross wage gets the gets the step teachers to 4.9 percent increase and then on the bottom you can see the step 19s who can't advance up anymore um, they're getting zero step and one and a half gross wage. So the chart on the bottom is just meant to show you sort of the distribution. So the, the wide band right here, as I mentioned, the teachers in the three to 18 are getting four and a half in step. And if you look across here, generally speaking, all of these steps you can see are between four and 5%. The last couple you can see shoot up a little bit. And then of course, 19, because there is no step, it's only one and a half percent. Did you take the <clears throat> steps that we have for our teachers and maybe uh, index them against the same step schedules for other districts? Uh, we did. And so that's, that's a couple pages back. Um, don't, want, don't go to that. Just keep going through the presentation. So, on this next page right here, this shows um, your shipment Mooney put together a great uh, sort of tracker of the last, you know, basically 12 months worth of settlements. And you can see the, the tall lines show the three-year settlement. And you can see Darian's on the far left right here and uh, with the largest, Hartford's on the right with the smallest. And then the shorter bars are just what the, what the average of those, one-third of that number. And so what, what I would point out here, you can see, so Darian's at 10.9, and that's how they compare it to other schools. Oh, it's 11.3 all, all in. But what I would point out here is that our average annual increase is, is certainly higher than others. But we have 72% of our teachers, 64% of our pool in steps 3 through 18 who are receiving steps. And we only have the 28% um, that are at the top and not receiving steps. So, and so for these other districts, that might be reversed. That have yes. a much higher percentage of teachers at the top. And, step. and like Greenwich is another good example. They have almost 50% of their teachers at the top step. So when you look at when you look at their settlement here, 50% of the teachers got 1.6%, and the other 50% moved through the steps. And we show we have some analysis here on what the other steps are. Right. So the next page here, um, this shows you how we compare to other schools, both in like DRGA and, and Southwest Connecticut here, as well as you know, Taylor Hill pull a few from Westchester and a few from Massachusetts. And you can see each one of these lines show, like for example, the masters, what the first step, what the minimum step is when you first come in and what the maximum step is when you actually stop receiving step increases. And I think you can see here, like the minimum for Darianne is 54,125. And you can see that minimum 
is pretty consistent with, the, with their other minimums. And even if, as you look to sort of Westchester or Massachusetts, it's relatively consistent. Now you can see that in terms of the minimum step, when you get to Scarsdale, Chappaqua, Rye, and others, it is higher. Quite a bit higher. Yeah. And I think when you compare the maximums, the top step, you can see, again, we're a little bit above Ridgefield and Wilton, kind of consistent with others in our area, and kind of consistent with Massachusetts, but when you look at Westchester, it's just, it's much higher. But when we looked at their steps, their step costs were much lower than ours do in Westchester. So, it, I'm sorry, when you say step costs were lower, what do you mean by that? So, Darren and Durge kind of averaged in the fours, like four and a quarter ballpark. Um, and that's really an average of an average of an average, but it's all kind of in the fours area. And when we looked at Massachusetts, it was kind of the same. But then if you looked at Westchester, it was in the high ones. So when you're going from your second or your third year, or your third year, or your fourth year, within the same band of education, their salaries don't rise as fast. And, and you can kind of see that. If you look at the far left on this table right here, using round numbers, the maximum in Darianne, the top step, is basically double the bottom step. So over that mm -hmm. category, their steps are spreading, mm -hmm. you know, hundred percent increase. When you look in the far right here, just for example on Rye, you can see that the max, the top step, yep. is not double. So you just there's less salary change between the min and the max in some of the in some of the certainly in the Westchester towns than there are in yep. you know, the dollar, the dollar on a dollar right basis, yes. Is, is, um, Right on. Well, yeah, the dollar is the same, but the dollar yeah. as the, the percentage, percentage of the base. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. Okay. And, and you can see the averages. Again, the midpoint is fairly consistent across your DRG. So. Well, that's why I'm saying like an indexing of this would be a nice thing to look at here yeah. next. Well, I mean, what one thing this shows you is that if you have a high <coughs> salary structure, the teachers stay. That's what this. Just well, looking at these averages versus the right. you see what I'm saying, yeah. or whatever the reason they yeah. are staying there, yeah, yeah, okay. So, the next page just same exact page, but it's a master's plus 30, that's our second highest educational cohort. And you can see for that group right here, again, the minimums are fairly consistent with our comps, the maximums are. Um, you know, certainly at or near the top with our comps, and the averages are relatively consistent. Again, except for when you compare it to to Westchester, they're noticeably higher. Okay. And then the last page here, just to show you some of the actual comparisons. Here are the actual numbers. So we took the master's degree. Again, that's where fifty percent of the teachers sit, and you can see where Darianne falls on the on the bottom of this net scale generally in the middle there, the 50th percentile. And if you look on the top of the master's degree, you can see, again, these are all Connecticut schools. Um, they're, they're very much near the top. What's right on the part. difference between the two columns? They both say master's degree. One's, one's minimum, minimum, one's a bottom oh, step, I'm sorry, and, a, and the right one's a top step. Yep. Jim, what's region nine? Uh, that's east of Reading. East of Reading. East, East, and, East and Reading, they, they have separate grade schools. They have a common high school. Okay. So I think what, you know, one of the takeaways here when you're looking at the number, when you're looking at the percentage increase per year, is just going to be that we have less teachers at the top step, more teachers at lower steps, Obviously, lower steps. Mm -hmm. you know, the less, and this is pretty much consistent across all contracts. Each year of experienced teachers are generally getting it, getting an increase up to the top step. We just have more teachers that are coming in that have less years of experience. So, therefore, from a dollars perspective, we have teachers that are certainly paid. I, I would say very fairly if you look at experience equivalent or, or years of years of service equivalent across other towns. We just have more. You know, given some of the turnover and stuff, we just have more teachers with less experience, which means, or I should say, less years of experience. Um, 
it would just mean they're, they're getting they're a lower salary. So if you looked at the average salary um, or the average number of years of service of their AM teachers, it's just less. It's just less. Yeah. Okay. So you know, I think one of the things that we took away was a teacher with five years of experience here is paid very fairly to someone with five years of experience somewhere else, and same with 10, same with 15, same with 19, um, but we just have more in the lower steps. I appreciate this <coughs> summary. It's terrific. I know you both put a lot of work on this, Taylor. Do you have anything else you wanted to add, given some of the analysis and research you've done? No. Okay. All right, so as you said at the beginning, the next step on this is the RTM discussion and approval of the teachers union contract. We, we actually don't have uh, an approval voice on that, other than your presence in that negotiation. And that uh, review is, when is that? That's January? I think based on past practice, they would, um, the Board of Ed typically files it in early February. Okay. And the RTM. In the past, they <coughs> filed it. Um, at the end of December, we're anticipating that it will be filed from the contract language is okay. settled early January. And so we'll either address it at our January meeting, which is what had been typical. I believe the last teacher's contract we addressed in February. Okay. And typically it's yeah. in January. Okay. I, I think, Jack, the, the last, just to be clear, like the last two contracts were both filed on February 6th. Okay. So and then they were addressed like on the third, either the third or fourth week at that. Yeah, that meeting. We, we don't have a lot of time, so uh, but we have 30 days. But we typically wait to final language is uh, written between the two because we did a nice summary. But like anything else, no offense, Frank, but when you get to the two attorneys together, get the words done, it takes a little bit longer. Okay. Okay, this is uh, excellent. I know this has been a complex and time consuming process for everybody involved. I think collectively we've learned a lot about the process and how we can improve it going forward, uh, collaborating with the Board of Education. And I think the more inclusive you are on all those voices, uh, and both at the beginning as well as the, during the process itself, uh, the better. And I think just in the discussions I know I've been a part of, we are definitely going to be focused more on that uh, for the next round of discussions of this nature. Does anybody have any further questions for Jim or for Taylor? John, I would just say, I, mean, I think one of the reasons that this is the largest single contract that the town signs, you know, generally it's a three year, $150 million contract, give or take, you know, including health care and so forth. So it's obviously it's, a, it's an important one. It's one right. that drives the budgets. Um, so. Well, and once this gets set, we've got no voice on anything that has to do with any of these numbers for the next three years. This is it. So to Jim's point, it's 50 ish million dollars a year, $150 million. <clears throat> over three years, that single number is bigger than one budget for any one year, right? That's about what we spend for the town. So it's very important that we have uh, an active discussion about how to strategize for this negotiation. I recognize that negotiations are difficult and a lot of it's confidential and a lot of it's based on strategies and tactics that both sides employ to try and get the best deal for their constituents. And so I'm, I'm mindful of all that, but making sure that the right voices are at the table at least for the towns, from the town's point of view, that those voices are at the table and, and uh, thoroughly represented in that process. But thank you for being part of the negotiating team, and and uh, I really appreciate this. So and I will say it was a pleasure to work with Dr. Adley, like to see him. You know, this was this was about a month after he was here, and I think he he really dug in. He had some things that were very important, I think, to build into the contract, and it was, you know, I'm very optimistic. I think that he'll be able to, you know really be a great leader. That's terrific. Okay. Uh, uh, Jack, yes. One other thing. Sure. While the salaries is one part of it, I do recall looking at like New Canaan's health care contribution they do a year before us. And when they were done with their contract in the prior one, not the one that they just finished, after three years they were still a percentage point lower than what we would have brought teachers were paying as part of their health care costs. So you have to take that when you're looking at the salaries to say that our teachers are the highest. Greenwich and some other schools still do longevity um, bonuses. We do not. And there's some other little nuances so that you really have to look at the total package because while it may look like everything's equal, it's all those little add-ons that really make um, the difference on, 
what we're really paying. And a lot of what has to do with whether or not teachers stay here besides the transportation time and cost, it's just that it's a good school system to work in. I did call their uh, medical contributions yeah. in New Canaan, and theirs are up. Uh, in 2021, it'll be 80-20, and then in 21-22, it'll be 79-21. Right, but they, we're already at 21. Right, we they've caught up. Yeah. Yep. Right. yeah, I think it's pretty clear that we are at the top. I think Greenwich was only at 16, or sorry, 13, and they're like on their way up. They're increasing it, but we're certainly, I think, uh, you know, among the teachers are giving am among the highest contributions. Okay. All right, thank you for that. Our next topic is the um, discussion of the five-year forecast, and so the purpose of this is to inform the uh, State of the Town address that I'll give next month on December 9th. Um, you all have seen the presentation that I did last year, and we talked last time about my updating that for some scenarios, and I've spent some time thinking about it. I'm, I'm going to dispense with scenarios this year, and the reason is that the purpose of those scenarios was to uh, explore a lot of what ifs. So what if certain things happened in Hartford, or what if certain uh, bad uh, outcomes or events took place? What would the, be the impact on the town's finances and on the average taxpayer? And I, I kind of have made that point, I think, thoroughly last time. What I'd rather do this time is shorten up the presentation and add uh, a few additional analyses that we've not uh, discussed before. And I had an iteration and a call with the Jennifer today on those. Uh, but for your reaction would be in addition to the updates of the slides that I did last year, uh, I want to put in a, a, grand list analysis, a grand list analysis, and this is building on some conversations we've had about it. Jim mentioned it at the last meeting. <clears throat> One of the things that people have worried about is that if you take the grand list and you stratify it into uh, fourths or fifths or wh whatever grouping that you want, and you compare sort of the most recent valuation with maybe the last one. The fear has been that with differential rates of increase or decrease in home values in those groups relative to each other, that you might find just, for example, in terms of the hypothesis, that home prices in that sort of top tranche, the top 20% have dropped more precipitously than the home prices or home values in the bottom tranches. And as a mathematical matter, what that means is that even if town spending is perfectly flat, the folks in the lower value homes end up paying actually more taxes. Their taxes go up even with flat spending. And so what I want to do is see if we can prove that. Jennifer tells me that Tony Hamicki has worked out something like this. I think it's in quartiles, is right. that right? Or by fourths. And so she is digging up that information. But I want to have that analysis as part of this just to give everybody some facts about uh, that particular trend which could be adverse depending on what group you're in, uh, but I, it remains to be seen if there's been significant differences in how uh, values have trended among those different groupings. Uh, certainly the, the word on the street is the higher priced home prices have fallen more precipitously, but let's just look at the facts. So I'm working on that. Um, a second one is I, I want to just have a clear explanation of where we ended up last year, uh, last fiscal year, so the 20. Uh, uh, 19, 20, or 2018, 2019 fiscal year. And the reason for that is that we had a big surplus this past year. And so I want to do an analysis that has the sources of that surplus so we can understand why. Uh, it's obviously a better place to be than uh, a deficit situation. But by looking at the sources of that surplus, it might actually inform our budget process in terms of where we might have just simply been over budgeting. So I want to have that out uh, for everybody to take a look at. And then finally, for 2019-2020, uh, just to give a quick update on where we are in terms of the budget this year, it'll draw, for example, a lot on the financial report from this meeting and just say, look, we started with this budget, here are square things trending, and here's the outlook for the rest of the year based on what we're seeing so far. Um, on capital project, just because we've had recent history and we've got big things on the docket, I want to have a quick update on where we stand on those. I wouldn't mind taking a look at two recently completed projects, the shuffle and the garage, just to show where things started in terms of budget and ended up in terms of uh, final numbers. And then give a quick overview of sort of budget and near-term plans for uh, Highland Farms, Spare Tree Point uh, Beach, and then the Oxridge Elementary School as our big projects right now. And then two last things I want to do, uh, sort of a one-pager on the teacher summary. I, I don't want to present all of this, but uh, I will figure out a way to come up with just a single slide that gives everybody a quick overview of that and tries to explain some of the uh, 
complexity that I think Jim addressed today. And then finally, uh, and Jennifer and I are not quite sure if this is possible, just given the uncertainty around the values, but it would be nice to have something that is, even if it's a little speculative, what would be the tax impact of all the new developments that are in progress, to just pop that on there and say, depends on what you believe in terms of how those projects will ultimately be valued, but uh, as a sort of a ballpark or a neighborhood view of what that could look like, just have a, a quick sense of the impact on the grand list and maybe the uh, average taxpayer to have those additional developments in town. So I've taken out a few slides, uh, a lot of the, uh, took out the special education and some of the more detailed things, so they'll shorten the presentation up quite a bit, but I'm going to add those few analyses and just fact perspectives uh, in there. Uh, my plan is that Jennifer's working on some of that data or Thanksgiving, I will actually finish the slides and send them around to the board for uh, your comment and input, but that's where it stands right now, and certainly I will be ready by December 9th with those slides, but uh, well before then for input from all of you. Uh, any questions or perspectives on, on what my plan is? Okay, thank you. Um, next up is the review of especially credit card fees. Jennifer. So I do apologize I didn't put a heading on it, but it's a front and back one sheet. Um, so kind of looking to restart our conversation on credit cards, I reached out to the departments and just said, let me know number, you know, volume and dollar value of transactions for the last fiscal year. And what we have here is a summary of which departments accept card credit cards, for what purposes, and what is their annual activity for both the number of dollar of transactions but also for the fees that we're paying. So going down the list, <coughs> Parks and Recreation, they do a lot of activity online. They had 14,000 transactions for just <coughs> about $1.26 million. But they do pay a lot in fees. They pay a credit card processing fee and they pay a per transaction software fee. They don't pay a software maintenance contract anymore. Um, and their net collections are about $1.2 million. So if we go across their credit card processing fees as a percent of their total transaction dollars is 3.17%. Per, we receive net fees from that. We don't actually have to pay the fees. The, <coughs> the software company just sends us the net amount. Um, DPW dump permits, they have a much smaller volume, about 2,400 2, transactions for $151,000 and their fees are about 4.8% of the transaction amount. And they are only taking credit cards in the office right now. Parking permits, um, we just started doing those online and the permits and the permit um, wait list are um, about five point, credit card fees are about 5.97% of their total transaction dollars. And then the next two are, they're a little different animal. They're the pay stations and the parking pay app. Um, so we did increase the fee from 3 to $4 a few years ago. And because they are such high volume, um, 112,000 transactions in a year for the app, 21,000 for the pay stations, they're high volume, low dollar. So the fees as a percentage of the dollar amount are pretty high. Um, but we did increase the um, daily rate by 33% a few years ago. So that's one where I don't think anything other than just an increase in the fee would really work because of the, the low dollar and high volume. <coughs> the bottom section are just other items that can be paid by credit card, but again, they, they're a little bit different. Our tax collector um, <coughs> taxes can be paid in office or online with credit card. And in both instances, 3% is charged to the taxpayer. Um, if they do it online, Webster Bank keeps it. And if they do it in the office, the town keeps it, which then offsets some other fees. So they actually have a negative um, fee um, when we look at net fees. And then parking tickets can be paid with a credit card, but we don't, we use a credit card, a uh, ticket processor, we don't pay credit card fees on that per se. And then building permits online just started in January 2019, so they only had 53 transactions. But in that case, the customer is paying an additional 2.95% fee for the processing. On the back page, um, just to look at the number of transactions, or the total collections that are being done by credit card. So in Park and Rec, 
um, net collections as a percent of their total revenue. So a lot, almost all of their transactions are done by credit card. For the dump permits, it's 53%, and for our parking permits, it's um, about average of 47%. And then the parking pay stations and the apps, 93% of collections are from um, credit cards. So Frank and I took a look at this a while ago and just talked it through. And it really does, on something like park and recreation where the vast majority are doing it through credit cards, um, you know, it seems to lend itself to the fee should cover the credit card processing. If all of the people are gonna pay by credit card anyway, or the vast majority, just incorporate it in the fee rather than having an additional tack on percentage or flat dollar amount. Um, the dump permits are a little bit a little bit different because they only have about 50% of their um, dollars coming through credit cards. They are looking to expand for to, um, in office credit card payments, but they're not there yet. <clears throat> so if I'm recalling earlier debate on all this, um, <clears throat> it was around uh, charging fees across the board and it looks like we've come out with a sort of a selective answer depending on uh, whether it's a large amount or uh, not charging a fee and simply embedding it into the price of the service in the case where most people use credit cards anyway. Um, so it looks like though we're still <coughs> net of all that we're, we're paying $141,000 in credit card fees. I guess my one question that I would have is I look at these percentages and I hear much smaller numbers that retailers pay for use of a MasterCard or Visa. Whenever I've seen giant numbers like this, it's always American Express, and that's why a lot of stores don't take American Express because the fees are so high. But when I see numbers like that, it just feels like we're, we're a, a long way away from what retailers pay. <clears throat> and as in a, a, a town with our volume, why is that percentage so high? Well, this is also going to be part of that technology assessment. Um, so right now, each as each department has wanted to accept credit cards, they've gone off with their software provider and gotten their own merchant service provider and done their own agreement. And so we have all these little silos. So we're not taking advantage of the volume that we have. So part of our technology assessment is to say, how can we have these various systems running through one merchant services account so we can take advantage of the volume? Um, because right now everybody's doing their own thing. Okay. So if you look at this schedule, uh, other than the technology assessment that might give us some insights about how to, how to reduce these fees further, it looks like you've layered in a few changes, either in terms of fee increases or uh, charging uh, for the use of credit cards. Is there anything on the horizon that's uh, sort of next or something you'd look to us for uh, guidance on, or is this merely to update us in terms of where things stand? This is, um, we would like some guidance from you okay. on what your feeling is on the best way to approach this. We know that we are, so we're looking to minimize the fees, but we know that we are gonna continue to have fees. And as more people choose to pay with a credit card, the fees that we pay are gonna continue to go up um, in pure dollar amount. So we're looking for some guidance on do you want fees when departments set them to be the fee is include or you know the registration fee or the, the user fee, the price of the product or service provided. Should that be inclusive and capture the credit card fees or would you prefer a structure where the fee is set at $100 and then there is either a flat dollar amount or a percentage additional processing fee? I think that's the the debate. <clears throat> Yeah, a couple of questions that about that. I mean, obviously building the fee in there include, encourages people to use credit cards because they're paying a fee no matter whether they use a credit card or not. So that's a consideration. Uh, if the fees are optically visible, it might in fact discourage that. Well, I'll just pay cash so I can avoid paying that fee. So one thing that we talked about in the past is whether use of credit cards actually saves significant administrative time, right? So if I'm using credit cards or most people are using that for my department and life's easy and I have less processing work or maybe they do it all online and I don't have to any, have anybody take anything. Uh, so I'm just kind of wondering whether in looking at this, since in some cases you've got um, a fee and in other cases like Parks and Rec, maybe the, you, you've got the 
fee sort of built into the pricing. Have you seen any sort of differential adoption rates or usage rates of credit cards between departments that have those different philosophies? That might, you may not know that now, but that might actually inform guidance that we would give you, especially if you could also say what the general department preferences are, right? To the department heads and the folks actually processing <coughs> this stuff. Uh, setting aside the issue of fees, do they really want to accept more credit cards? Does that make their life easier or, or make uh, sort of capture of data and just management of their departments uh, better if we could aggressively promote the use of credit cards or, or not? The other question I had was, uh, I'm just kind of curious as to why these percentages are so different. Maybe it's just the size of the transaction, but it strikes me that these are all individual departments, but it's all kind of one town, right? So why wouldn't we have just sort of one deal with one bank that has the same fee for everything as opposed to these differential fees? And I'm just kind of wondering why Which that's Which is what case. we need to move to. Okay. Um, that's what we need to move to. I think I can actually recommend that now <laughs> with, with no further discussion required. I'm going out on a limb here. But. Um, and so, like I said, with the technology assessment, it's going to look look at that, see what our systems can do to feed into the same processor, and more than likely we'll end up doing an RFP um, for merchant services to get it all under one umbrella. Um, but like I said, each department, as they've started taking it, they've worked with their software provider, and the software provider says, oh, we use so-and-so <coughs> processing, and this is their standard agreement. And another software uses a different processor and this is their standard fee structure um, it hasn't been a cohesive planned approach to bringing um, departments online or on board with accepting credit cards they've all operated in their own silos yeah, I think they I think they could definitely have points of view but <clears throat> I guess the other thing maybe to recommend is the selectmen ought to just decide that and implement it unless there's some rule that says they can't actually exercise that kind of authority but once the policy is decided there really shouldn't be deviation from that especially mm -hmm. if it's costing the town money <coughs> Jack waits with bated breath <laughs> for a moment to speak on this topic but he can only speak on this topic if he does so in a short and pithy way <laughs> I think can we uh, just a couple more comments. I think Dan, you want to say something? Yeah, just, yeah, uh, one, not just, just one moment. Just just one moment. Yeah, Sorry. This probably goes without saying, but uh, I think the Harbor Master uses PayPal. I, I may not. And so some of the online services, whether it's, I don't think Venmo is for commercial transactions, but. Only for people under 21, I think, is the old Venmo thing. <laughs> I certainly, I mean, uh, that's who, But that's there's, what they there's probably use. a commercial well, equivalent of Venmo. Right. And <laughs> my guess is the transaction costs are much less than Amex or maybe even Visa or MasterCard. Right. So as part of the technology assessment, we've certainly, and that, that's probably well yeah, within that, what that you guys is have part thought about it. already. We want to look at. Um, what other payment methods should we be considering besides yes. cash check and the, the normal credit card payments? Thank you, Dan, for setting up. Yeah, and my, my only thing, when this is near and dear to our heart, um, so I know he's going to say this more eloquently than me, but um, some of these, like the pay stations, but just immediately, we should just push back on some of the vendors. Just 26% is just incredible on some of these. And 9% and on, the, on the park, too. There's just, I understand everything's built in a silo. Right. But some I of these guys, somebody, we should at least right, it, but it's like a call into like somebody. A dollar $1 per transaction. A dollar on four is 25%. Of your $4 right. that's the payment. Payment. But yeah, I mean, we're, that's, that's, you look at it, we're getting 122,000 bucks in revenue. For $4 transaction. Yeah, we're, we're getting $122,000 in fees, and $32,000 of that is being paid out as fees to the vendor. Right. Everybody's got to eat lunch, I get that. But and, and sorry, Jim, one last thing. Hours. And to your, to your point a little bit, John, the cost is actually, if I'm looking at this right, it's actually 180000 right? So you got 141 processing, you got a software fee of 20, call it 20, 30000 okay. and then throw the contract fees below on the other, in the parking department. So it's actually costing us 181000 yeah. all in, like the way right. I view it. Um, the software fee just at the top, who's charging 30 when you're already making 40s. Do we know what vendor that is? Is that like bottom line or one of those companies? It's called um, ActiveNet and it's a per trans, anything that runs through their system as a registration. So even if somebody comes in office and registers with a check mm -hmm. and because they use it as their registration system also it gets entered in there and it doesn't get the credit card processing but it gets the per transaction right. software fee on it. Just and there's probably some other software that we use for people who pay like cash too. And so we don't have those software numbers. Just an FYI, I've got some background in it. If you need help, want help, just please let me know. Are you familiar with them? 
Hmm? Are you familiar with them? Yes. Okay. Winner and a few other ones. So, just any other know, board comments? To your points, if we could just funnel it down to maybe yep. one or at best two vendors, you have 151,000 transactions to give them. Yeah. That's a pretty good starting point. Okay. Sorry, Jack. Mr. Davis. No, they, I'm, I'm glad that Dan actually set, set up. Having, having worked for both Chase, which is the largest payments bank, and uh, MasterCard in their new product area, I have a pretty good understanding of here. The one major um, payment, uh, this isn't, shouldn't just be credit cards. This is a cash management issue. And we should be taking a step back and saying, what payment types are there? And I'm sure that's part of the analysis that they're going to be doing. Because one thing that many other towns accept that we do not is an ACH payment. And as my last recollection, an ACH payment costs about 25 cents a transaction. And it is two days um, available funds. It's in your account. And um, many of the things that I'm seeing here, um, such as the parking and other things like that, would be better paid by an ACH. It would reduce our costs and would give us more timely payment mechanisms because I don't know what the timing is from when we make a payment to when the merchant processor actually credits our account and so there's another cash management issue there. Um, Jen was absolutely right on the smaller transactions you're getting both an interchange fee and a transaction charge and when you're dealing with $40 um, beach stickers or other things like that the charge gets very high. Um, as Rob mentioned um, one of the things that F&B had mentioned some time before is that the slew of merchant processors doesn't allow you to consolidate. Your volume is typically done based upon what volume you're putting through um, their channels on a timely basis for going from there. So all of those, if, um, and I'm sure Jen and um, Kate, as Kate would like me to say, have considered this um, as part of the RFP. Um, I think is, is important, but it is important to also start to look at how the new payments are starting to evolve. I happen to be over 50 um, by Barely. more than a number of years, and I pay my son and through Venmo all the time. Um, it's the only way to transfer s funds between the kids. Um, I, well, Venmo may not be... Um, allow there are things as Apple Pay other payment mechanisms and so as I said it's taking a step back looking at what's available for a town what is the settlement and the chargeback fees and other things like that associated with that and coming up with a overall cash management plan I think the two biggest things are going to be debit credit cards and um, the ACH however when we get to the taxes that is going to continue to be a 3% charge because if somebody's paying their uh, $20,000 tax bill, we want to at least recover the interchange of what we're paying on that. Otherwise, we're receiving less taxes than what was in the plan. So I think that will always be a charge. And while I understand the easy way on park and rec is to just raise everybody's cost, um, I you are just telling everyone to, that we're going to have to pay from credit card, which is only going to increase. Otherwise, the people who choose not to pay by credit card are really subsidizing those that do. Right. So, okay. thank you. I think no, it's a great you. study to do. I think the, the, go ahead, Frank. Uh, property taxes, there's some of that's done by ACH today, right? There is the option, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Well, we don't have it in other yeah. departments, yeah. that would be great. Well, I think uh, a study to kind of lay all this out and <clears throat> come up with a set of common facts, I think this, this was a good start, for example, but to your point, when you add some of these numbers up, the, the, the picture is a bit more stark. And so I think having a study that gets all those facts laid out, uh, but also gathers perspectives from the individual departments, takes a look at what other towns are doing, to Jack's point, explores the evolving landscape of payment options and tries to figure out a way to incorporate all that. And then also takes into account the point of view of the various constituents for these services. I think that's a great idea to undertake a service like that. So I don't, or a study like that, I don't know if that's just something the department's gonna convene or, or launch or if that's gonna be selectman launched or, or whatever that is. But 
I think it's important enough, given the the amount of money being uh, under consideration or involved in all this, but just sort of the future look about how payment uh, payments are handled and how cash is managed when it comes into the town from sources like this. I think it's pretty interesting, actually, and, and important. And so maybe at some point, if it makes sense to have maybe a member of this board join in or be more active in trying to support that study, that might not be a bad idea. And I know Jack certainly would like to have a an opportunity for some type of organized input into this. So as you all think about what that study looks like and decide how it's going to get chartered, that why maybe we can bring that up and, and participate in a more uh, active way. And Jen, thanks again for this. this was yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, take action and res uh, on resolution <coughs> reallocating unspent bond proceeds. Jennifer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so th this is basically closing out a final part of closing out um, capital projects that are complete and had excess bond funds that we borrowed. So what you as a board are able to do, you're not going to change appropriations on any currently authorized bond projects, but you can move the bond proceeds over to these newer projects and we will just borrow that much less on these projects. So what we're looking to do is move um, the amounts shown here, the high school cafeteria project, the DPW garage project, the turf project, they were all completed. Um, we're looking to move funds around to the Highland Farm project, to the um, town hall generator, and to Oxridge Elementary School. Okay. <clears throat> this seems pretty straightforward and there's no, there are no other set of uh, <coughs> rules or regulations governing something like this, so as long as they're the funds have been appropriated and bonded. <coughs> we have the authority as a board to move things around to yep. the extent any of those projects are in surplus. Right, or, you're, or, you're, sorry, just, yeah, you're surplus. just moving the bond proceeds to another currently authorized project. An, an appropriated project, okay, yep. fine. Okay. And Jen, they, they all match the remaining useful lives, like the useful life tests? Uh, for the most part, um, they are pretty small numbers, um, so we didn't really look into that too much. Um, but we did try to keep them like to like so that our debt service stays the same um, between the, the town and school categories. But the, the two recipients here are, are both long term, so right. it, we could finance that with short term. So, in other words, we've got to meet that requirement. Okay, this seems uh, straightforward to me. So, <clears throat> no other questions then. A uh, motion to approve resolution reallocating proceeds of the town of Darien's $12,460,000 general obligation bonds issue of 2017, dated September 14, 2017, and $4,185,000 general obligation bonds issue date of 2019, dated April 2nd, 2019. Motion to approve that. Uh, Rob, second. Jim, all in favor? Okay. Only because we enjoyed you. I know. You like, <laughs> you, you really like it when I read the entire resolution at the end of the budget cycle, which yeah, I that's well, promise you I will do that that's again. Usually, yeah, that's usually the budget one. All right. Um, okay, financial report. Um, not much going on on our monthly report of revenues and expenditures and the general fund tax collections are um, doing very well. We're at 53% for the year. And just want to remind you that we did change our our property tax numbers. So the five-year average is a little bit skewed because we used to put a much lower budget number in there um, for this year and the year before we're at reality. So 53% um, is a very good collection rate for the first um, few months of the year. Building permits continue to be that unknown based on the redevelopment projects. Um, but year-to-date for just base permit revenue, we are ahead of last year. On the expenditure side, really the big item is the additional $2 million that we moved into debt service um, to cover the early redemption, and that is scheduled to occur on November 29th, um, so a week from Friday. On page 5, the summary of state revenues. The Town Aid Road, we budgeted $341,000. Um, 
the last update that I had was November 5th saying th these are um, get allocated through the State Bond Commission and it was expected that within the next couple of weeks the governor would call um, the State Bond Commission to have their meeting and appropriate funds. So we should expect to receive town aid road funds soon. Everything else is coming in as expected. Um, one addition on page six, and this was Jim's suggestion where we're looking at contingency accounts. We've, we've also added unassigned fund balance. So our unaudited but pretty close to certain fund balance to start the year was 25.2 million, which was 17% of our fiscal 20 um, budgetary revenues. Our bond redemption is gonna draw down that fund balance by 2,175,000. So all other things being equal, we would end the year at 23 million, which is 15.61% of our fiscal 20. Versus our 12% floor. Correct. Okay. And that is all that I had to highlight. Well, I, I didn't see anything else that raised a question on the reports. Did you have any questions for gentlemen? Just one, qu Can, I have one please. question on page five on the special ed excess cost reimbursement number. Is that 100% of what we are owed or 100% or of what we budget, was, which is 72% well, so, or so, so the number, what we So the number reflects what they expect to receive, which itself is an estimate of what the total cost of those students, what it costs in total to educate those students. The piece of that that's over the per student reimbursement threshold, which is four and a half times the average student cost, uh, and then an estimate of the percentage of that total that will actually get reimbursed, which historically is in the low 70s somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so the number that you're seeing there is what they actually expect to get, or at least from, from their budget. So. Okay, um, we've got a couple of minutes to approve, one from the October 15th meeting and then that brief special meeting that we had to have to approve um, Oh, the fund balance contribution for um, uh, for the refunding resolution. So the first one is the October 15th minutes. Uh, I read through that and I did not have any corrections. Did anyone else have any corrections to the October 15th minutes? Okay, if not, so I can vote on them, Paul, Jim, and Rob, the four of us could vote since we were all there for that. If uh, no other questions or edits on the October 15th minutes, motion to approve. Okay, Rob, second. Paul, all in favor? So we'll do four to zero to three. Three abstentions. And then the last one was this uh, special meeting that we had re re uh, regarding the uh, contribution from fund balance, fund balance for the funding resolution that Jim had worked on, and this was on October 28th. I can vote on it, Frank, Paul, and Jim again. Uh, any, I, I did see one edit on there. Paul's name is misspelled on the last page under adjournment. Hendrickson. Other than that small edit, I think that was it for the special mini, mini meeting minutes. Uh, any other further, further edits? Okay, uh, motion to approve. Rob, second, Frank, all in favor? Okay, again, four, two, zero, two, three. Okay, uh, committee assignments. So this is a good time here to take a look at that. The committees I have here, unless I've missed something, we have our audit committee. <coughs> We've got the Pear Tree Point Beach Construction Committee or Building Committee. We've got the shared services effort that Frank has done. We've got the Oxridge Building Committee. I actually don't know. Has there been a Highland Farms Building Committee or anything like that no. established? All right, so that's still uh, still pending. So on the audit committee last year, it was uh, Jim, Rob, and Jamie. Is that right? Yep. So we need to appoint a replacement for Mr. McLaughlin. Um, does anybody have an interest in joining the audit committee? Taylor, would you like to join the audit oh. committee? Excellent. It's excellent fun. Just to let you know. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I can tell. It's, it's, it, it, audit committees everywhere have that kind of reputation. So <laughs> actually that, that would be uh, <clears throat> terrific. Do we need votes on committee assignments? I don't uh, recall that. Wouldn't hurt. Wouldn't hurt. Okay, motion to, uh, could I get a motion to approve Taylor as our next representative to the three-person audit committee? Dan, second, Rob, all in favor? Okay. Six, two, zero, two, one, thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Taylor. I appreciate that. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> it's me, you, and Rob. Okay. It's I like fun. that. I like that sort of post-appointment committee transparency. Yeah, it's really kind of <laughs> helpful kind of a way that we do things on this board. Okay. Next is the Pear Tree Point uh, Building Committee. That's a a busy committee, or it has been, uh, but as you know, that project I think has been uh, suspended to a degree by our first selectman as um, additional work is, is undertaken to sort that out. Uh, you'll recall that Diana McGuire was our representative for that effort. Uh, she has certainly volunteered to stay on it or help with the transition, but probably better that we transition to one of our existing board members uh, for this new term. So. Frank, we have talked about that, and I believe you and Dan sorted out that you would uh, take on that yeah. happy assignment since he is going to be secretary. So I, I certainly appreciate that. Is that okay with you? Yeah, yeah. it needs to be a Democrat. That's the... Yeah, it did. So <laughs> why did you two guys? <laughs> so you, 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 I, I, I see uh, you lost the arm wrestling match with <laughs> Dan over that. Uh, sorry to hear that. Um, no, that's good, and, and I think having you guys uh, having you part of that is uh, is going to be very helpful so I, I appreciate your willingness to do that uh, motion to approve frank as our representative to the pear tree uh, point uh, building committee paul <coughs> second jim all in favor okay thank you and i'll buy you a helmet <laughs> okay helmet and body armor let's uh, get an appropriation for that too um i don't think we really have a committee for this frank has been leading a a maybe less a committee and just an ongoing discussion with members of Board of Education and administration about ways to uh, increase the amount of shared services we have among the b between the town and the Board of Education <clears throat> that's really just an ongoing uh, discussion as opposed to uh, sort of a formal committee and I assume that we'll over the course of this year continue those efforts so I appreciate you doing that uh, Oxridge I'm happy to continue to serve on that a committee uh, uh, continues to move along as as you all know certainly they have a lot of uh, public um, uh, meetings as well as information on the website where you can keep very close tabs on all that uh, but it is starting to heat up and so one of the things I want to do uh, starting at the next meeting is have a little bit more complete update so that we're as we move into the design phase and uh, get ramped up to start to uh, actually execute the project I'd like to have the board a little bit more informed on that uh, just as a reminder, particularly for our two new board members, the way this worked out, in order for us to qualify for certain uh, state funding and, and reimbursement, we actually had to do the appropriation early on before any of this was actually uh, uh, planned to any degree. So $63 million actually has been appropriated by the RTM to fund this, this project. And that essentially means that the building committee has full authority to spend all that money because it's been appropriated. So. We, I want to make sure that that is done uh, properly and correctly, uh, but the best way to do it is to communicate openly about it so everybody's eyes open about those decisions and uh, can understand them and have input if needed. So I think we're in good shape there, and Highland Farms, we will deal with that when the selectmen decide to establish that committee. What about the portables kind of, um, obviously discussions have sort of again started right on I think it started. I don't know whether the threshold for that will rise to building committee level. I think the million dollars was something we decided before. I just don't know what the replacement cost of those is going to be, but to the extent that it meets that threshold, then absolutely. I, I think I would get. I think it's it would definitely meet that threshold. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And 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 I do think they at the last board of a, ed meeting they actually approved. I think seventy five thousand yeah. to hire a sort of a strategic. Okay. Um, so why don't you just check in on that? I'll we check in on that. With it next time. Okay. Yep. And one question on the Norton Heights train station development. I've heard it referred to as a committee, but it might, a committee's been formed, but it might be a small C committee versus a building committee um, at a board of selectmen meeting a, a few weeks ago. Uh, that there are a number of people that are spending time evaluating that subject. So I'm sorry, you're referring to the private developments? That are Heights, right? No, the Neurotin Heights train station okay. redevelopment. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I actually don't know how far along that is and whether we've got to a point where there might be value in appointing a committee like that. I think that's an excellent idea though for something that particularly that's got that kind of visibility. And I'm sure there's some town funding responsibility for that in any case, so it might there's actually be. There's a 20 some million dollar preliminary budget associated right. with it. It's unclear as to what our portion of that would be versus right. the state or the condot. 
Yeah, I would be stunned if it's zero on our part, <laughs> uh, <laughs> just given where we are. Uh, but that's an excellent point. That's actually another one. As we get uh, clarity on that, we should have a, uh, a committee for that. Uh, some of the decision making might be outside our control, especially if our share in the cost is uh, uh, significantly less than 50%, which we certainly hope for. But given the public um, uh, sort of presence of a project like that, I think that's pretty important. That's a great idea. Anything else in this, this regard with regard to committees? Pension committee. Uh, All right. Pension board. Um, we'll, continue. I think we'll continue. Excellent. We, uh, we will leave you in that happy capacity. Thank you. Okay. There's one thing more exciting than accounting. It's actuary. Okay. <laughs> um, having served on that, uh, that happy board for uh, eight years, I can, I can attest to that. So special assignment or committee reports, I think we've talked about assignments to the committees. I don't know that any committees have any particular assignments, so we can pick that up next time. Chairman's report, I did have one thing to mention. Um, I sent around two suggested uh, inputs to the community values statement. And so this is something that the Board of Selectmen are working on that uh, uh, Jamie has uh, championed. And she's asked for input from various town entities, uh, us included. And so what I, I didn't bring printouts of all this, but what I sent around, find it. It's right here, just if you want. Oh, thank you. Uh, oh, great, I appreciate that. Yeah. All right, so I had two um, statements here. The first one was, uh, and consistent with my comments at the last meeting, all elected and appointed officials should strive for civility, transparency, and understanding in their dealings and relationships with each other. And then second was, the town should manage its finances prudently and conservatively, striking a careful balance between expenditures and the long-term interests of taxpayers. And so this is consistent with what I suggested or proposed at the last meeting that we try to do something that is a very high level and has a sort of values orientation to the language, but it's also um, uh, something that you'd want to strive for that's non-obvious, right? So we really do want civility and transparency, and sometimes we have to remind ourselves of that. And then in terms of uh, fiscal prudence, that's something that I think as a town we've done a good job at, but uh, frankly could be uh, an, an area that requires us to raise this as a value if we see uh, spending or proposals for spending getting out of hand. So those were my two suggestions. Dan, it looks like you've got some input here. Jim, I know you had an, an additional statement that you thought about uh, proposing for this, which I think I've got on my phone if you don't have it handy. Um, but that's that's kind of where I was on all that. Um, maybe if you want to look that up, Dan, you had uh, suggested. I just that. added two words, mutual respect, which maybe is implied in civility, but maybe more to the point. I see no reason not to add that. So it would read, strive for civility, mutual respect, transparency, and understanding in their dealings and relationships with each other. I think that's terrific. Right, I think we should delegate a little bit to Jamie and others how, oh, they, how, well, how the words get kind yeah, of- It's totally right, and I, I, I want to reemphasize, this is not, right, they, this, that she just asked for input. So the selectmen may look at this and say, this input is dreadful beyond words. We're not going to use any of it, which is completely fine because it's their value statement. They just added, asked for input from the yeah. board. So to your yeah. point, this is a, this is take it, edit it, or leave yeah. it advice yeah. to the board of selectmen. This is completely their purview. Okay, uh, Jim. You know, I just su suggested something that might like, somehow, somehow encompass the fact that like, when we're looking at appropriations of budgeting or big capital projects or so forth, that we should sort of, you know, we should always do so based on a like, very detailed and transparent and kind of full on um, analysis, just because I, I do think things that we've really spent a lot of time planning for capital projects um, have, have generally kind of turned out better the more analysis that went into them ahead of time. I'm not sure if that kind of falls into John's second comment about um, kind of fiscal prudence and so forth, but I, I do think kind of yeah, my, my quick reaction when I saw that is I, <clears throat> I absolutely think we should be doing that. My and, and what we may end up doing is <clears throat> simply to suggest that, that let the Board of Selectmen decide whether that type of statement is something that fits into their overall values. My quick reaction when I saw it was it felt like a strong and useful procedural point <clears throat> as, opposed, as a, opposed to something that felt values oriented and then maybe there was a way to word the language. but. Uh, frankly, they're just looking for input from us. 
and I would be okay including a statement like that. And, and whether they use it or not, it actually might just remind them that, look, when you're thinking about these projects, uh, and maybe there's something that uh, applies sort of town-wide in terms of, of the way those things are uh, uh, structured or the types of inputs that go into them, could, in fact, it would be valuable for them to reflect that somewhere in their value statements. I, I would be okay including that in what we, we send to the selectmen. Any other I, suggestions? I, I like it too. I like the idea that Darien would be in analytics. Yeah, kind well, of an <coughs> a, a, a plus planning analytics yeah. generally pretty. Well, and since Jim is the most analytic, I'm, I would actually be disappointed <laughs> if he didn't suggest something like that. So I, I, I appreciate that. So I think with Dan's slight wording change and this additional third point that uh, Jim has selected, <coughs> what I'll do is package that up, uh, send it to Jamie and let her uh, uh, add that to all the other input I'm sure they're getting on the community value statement. Sound okay? Yep. Okay. Um, I don't think we had any other business. Did anyone else have any questions or comments? Okay, I think we are uh, done. Again, congratulations to our two new board members. I think I speak for all of the old board members when I say welcome. We look forward to working with you and uh, assigning you as much work as humanly possible. So but anyway, welcome aboard and uh, thank you. Uh, we'll see you at our next meeting. A motion to adjourn. Uh, uh, Rob and Frank second. All in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you. Thanks.